one of the things that we deal with, Joe, is we allow people who watch this and view this program to think the way they think and feel the way they feel. Uh, we make no apologies for saying that we are not arrogant enough to say that we know how anybody thinks or feels. And there's so many people who feel so invalidated by when they're being told you shouldn't think that way, or that's crazy, or when they're trying to explain their thoughts and feelings to someone and the other person turns it on himself. Well, they say, well, you're, you always get yourself in these situations or, uh, how do you think that may, how do you, the way that you're acting makes me feel, uh, is it, were you validated in your life when you were young? Were you, did you have anybody that just heard you, Joe? Um, yes. Um, uh, my father's sister was, um, a woman who, um, had some serious, uh, cardiac issues. Uh, she had tried to have a child herself and the child had died about two days uh, after she gave birth. And at that time, I was about three years old. And in effect, she kind of co-opted me as the child that she was unable to have. And so when we would visit uh, my dad's family, his mother uh, was living with this, uh, his sister and her husband. Um, we would go down there pretty much weekly and she always gave me a sense that I was unconditionally loved. Unfortunately, she died when I was 12. Mm. And I recognize that as one of the critical formative things that happened to me. Um, prior to that, only one relative, my grandmother on my mother's side had died. And although we also visited them weekly, she had significant health issues at her age. And so she was unable to give that same sense of um, unconditional love. Were you comfortable with her? Um, I think I've probably found her a little more intimidating. Mm -hmm. um, in the family, on my mother's side, she mm -hmm. was regarded as the general. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's a very different temperament mm -hmm. than what I got from this, this one aunt. That's what I mean, the aunt. Uh, yeah. Did you feel comfortable with her? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Did you feel like you were being heard? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. So that's our hope that people get that type of sense of belonging. That it's, it's too often that young people's feelings and thoughts are discounted because, oh, they're young. Oh, that's a phase. Mm -hmm. They'll get over it. What, what people could understand is that people's thoughts and feelings, no matter how old they are or what their age, are as significant as anyone of any age. A heartache to a 16-year-old is as significant or even more significant than, let's say, a heartache to a 40-year-old. I saw a documentary recently on Fred Rogers and his TV show, and it was very clear that his principal objective in that show was to make children feel that they were loved, and the way he did that was by making them feel that they were heard. And I think that's an excellent formula. In this documentary, it pointed out that at one time, uh, after the show had been running for a number of years, he tried to do a comparable show for adults, and they couldn't connect the same way that the children could because that experience of being heard had not really been a sufficient part of their experience. Mm -hmm. So how do you explain that to people? How do you try to incorporate that in people's lives, not only to listen to their own bodies and listen to themselves, but pay close attention and be present with others? Well, I think until one achieves um, a sufficient level of self-acceptance and self-compassion, that I'm okay as I am, regardless of the shortcomings that I might have, even if my body doesn't seem perfect according to whatever the advertising standards are, until I can do that, it's going to be very, very difficult for me to accept other people in that way. Because as I think you were suggesting earlier, we tend to project our own sense of inadequacies onto other people. That inner critical voice becomes the way we speak to other people. And so I always need to come back to this sense that for today, I'm okay as I am. I can do these things. Um, I don't need to do these other things. 
and that's fine. And if I feel that way, then it's possible for me to create a space for someone else to feel that way about themselves. So what we often try to do, Joe, is incorporate these I am statements into people's lives. Mm -hmm. And we start off with indisputable truths, like I am five foot, eight inches tall. I am mm -hmm. male. I have blue eyes. I am a son. I am a brother. Whatever. Indisputable mm -hmm. truths. And everything becomes a matter of perspective. Uh, I remember this story that I heard once. There was a uh, plane, a junket that arrived in another country. And this couple got off the plane and they walked uh, through the terminal and they came to this old person sitting on a bench and they said, uh, we just came to your country. What are the people like here? And that person said, well, what are the people like in your country? And this man said, well, they're kind of mean and nasty and self-centered and they're all about themselves. And the mm -hmm. person looked at them and goes, I think you'll find people here just about the same. Mm -hmm. And the next couple that came through said to stop and said to this person, we're brand new in your country. Could you tell us a little bit about the people here? What can we expect? And the person said, well, what are the people like in your country? He says, well, they're generally kind and they're, they're compassionate and they look out for each other. Uh, and that person looked at him and said, I think you'll find people here about the same. Yes. And I think that's what I had in mind when I said, when we love ourselves, when we have that compassion for ourselves, we then see that in other people. And we encourage that to be part of the way that they respond to us. And when we do that, um, we find that it's much easier then to respond. To so here's the teaching point here. How does a person start that journey when they have such a low self-concept and low self-esteem about mm -hmm. themselves? How does a person begin to that journey, Joe? Generally, you have to find among the people that you're already familiar with somebody who seems to have that potential, um, somebody that you find yourself feeling more comfortable with from the get-go. And when you share with them the problems that you're experiencing about yourself, you can trust that they will recognize that. They'll be able to share their own feelings as well. Mm -hmm. That's not always readily available. Um, it doesn't always happen within your immediate family. It doesn't always happen among your classmates or whatever while you're in school or your neighbors uh, while you're there. But um, if you have some degree of um, a sense of, let's say, safety in your neighborhood, then it's possible that you'll be able to identify someone in that circle of people that will give you that sense. So let's say in your life you don't have to give details or name individuals, but how did that happen for you? Well, um, in spite of the fact that I lost this, this aunt at a very young age, or relatively young age, um, there were other people in my neighborhood, friends that I played with. Um, they weren't always classmates. They may have gone to other schools, but um, I had a sense with them that uh, we had enough uh, compatibility that I could talk about what was happening with me and then um, allow them to talk about what was happening with them and using that common ground then as a foundation for building up this sense of um, both trust and mutual compassion. Um, unfortunately, we also moved after this one aunt died and so all of those childhood friends that I had were pretty much out of reach. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that was probably the second step in, in my So it, it takes a lot of courage for a younger person to make themselves vulnerable. Yes, it to does. To be able to share that. And quite often, if a person gets, let's say, burnt once or mm -hmm. twice, they become very reticent about sharing things. And they begin to develop some real trust issues. Yes, they do. And uh, it becomes that much harder. Um, unfortunately, at an early age, um, I don't think we get um, the kind of spiritual education that enables us to put that into a healthier perspective and to recognize that there is always um, a figure, higher power, whatever you want to call it, 
that is finally the foundation of who we are. So our society views this higher power concept that you're talking about, some type of spirituality, as religion. Okay, mm -hmm. And I don't think there's enough differentiation or explanation of the difference between spirituality and religion. Yes. Most people, if you talk to a 10 or 11 or a 12 year old and you talk to them about spirituality and religion, they probably, through no fault of their own, would be unable to differentiate between them. Right. They, view, they view that with being forced to go to some type of a facility and participate in some type of a ritual. organized ritual. Right. Okay. Right. Which most people rebel against. Right. And rightly so. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's been increasingly clear to me um, as I've gone through my own uh, development in the most recent years that um, most of us are educated in spirituality to see it as something that functions through the rituals and doctrines of a particular religion. And what I'm really talking about here is a sense that is intuitive. It's a sense that whatever that spiritual, um, maybe just call it spirit, is, is something that we each have uh, within us. Um, we sometimes identify it with our heart, but it's definitely at the center of what keeps us alive and helps us to thrive. And um, I think as a, as a child, um, we get some sense of that, but it's outside of our religious education. So, for example, if I am outside and it's a beautiful day and I'm just, you know, going for a walk or a bike ride or something like that, and I'm able to pay attention to the whole natural world. Paying experience. attention. Let's, again, right. let's stop right there. Let's break this thing down. Okay. Let's, paying attention. Right. So I'm there and I'm conscious of the impact that just being in this natural environment is providing for me. So how would you describe that to a 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 year old? How would you have them participate in that experience? What would you suggest they do? Okay. Go for a walk with someone. Okay. And share what it is that they're experiencing on that walk what it is that they're enjoying about it. And that can include the company that they may have brought with them. Um, but also, uh, it means just getting a sense of, you know, here's a tree. What is really nice about that tree? Um, here is a field. What is it that you smell? What is it that you feel? What is it that you sense with that? And the kind of sensation that provides a sense of joy or happiness in that environment is in fact the kind of sensation that one should be getting from an awareness of spirit. So what you're talking about now is not trying to get to a particular destination to be, to, but to be in the journey. Right. Okay. And paying attention on purpose, labeling and describing, slowing down. And that is the essence of being in the moment. Right. So, and of course we live in a world that seems to be on hyperspeed and we have to get somewhere very quickly. So how do you, how do you convey that across to someone to slow down? It's very difficult to do that with adults. I think with children, um, they have a lot of natural energy uh, for the most part, and you want to allow them to enjoy that, but you also want to talk to them about how that felt while they were doing mm. it. Keep their awareness honed. Um, I mean, what you're saying about living in that present moment, um, you can't always do that with reflection, but you can certainly reinforce um, the sense of happiness that kid might be having from an immediate experience. So how do we, how do we incorporate the importance to adults, parents, uh, caregivers, significant others to actually be able to explore thoughts and feelings with, with a child, with okay. a, with a young person, with an adolescent? Okay. Um, it has to I, be, I can't tell you how important I yeah, think this is. I, I think it actually has to begin before adolescence. Yes. Um, I don't think it happens often enough, but um, every parent should be able to spend time with their children and 
pay attention to them. You know, let them know that you're interested in what they're thinking or what they're doing or what they're worried about, whatever that might be. And affirm that um, the things they're experiencing are something you uh, recognize as true, that you are not just dismissing them, not paying attention, not listening, any of those kinds of things. Um, hugs are good. <laughs> um, if you feel like you want to sing with your kid, sing with your kid. Uh, give them those kinds of experiences that they can share with you as a parent. And if you can do that while they're younger, yeah, they'll hit some bumps when they become adolescents, but they'll have this foundation of connection with you that um, enables them then to develop that sense of self-worth and to develop that sense that they can share that and uh, provide that for other people. So you were talking about unconditional love before, and quite mm -hmm. often what we try to incorporate is unconditional acceptance, okay? Mm -hmm. Unconditional positive regard, mm -hmm. that we don't have to accept the behavior, we always accept the person. Too often they're, they're merged you know, mm -hmm. you're stupid, you're ugly, you'll never get anywhere, you'll, if you keep doing this, you're going to end mm -hmm. up a bum or whatever, okay? Mm -hmm. The idea is that every child is a pure, beautiful person, and if we separate the behavior from the person and say, Johnny, I love you, however, the behavior, that might be something we want to look at, okay? Unconditional positive regard. How many parents, how many people would say to someone, you can tell me anything, you can always come to me with anything that's on your mind. However, when you do, then we then they go to DEFCON 4, all right. right, and get very excited. Or how often does a father come in and say, what's wrong with her? Mm -hmm. uh, why is she being like that? Mm -hmm. uh, so what do you have to... What do you have to say about that? How would you incorporate that type of skill into a parent to have them stop and actually listen? How do you teach active listening, Joe? Yeah. Um, I think it's something that you have to, most of us have to grow up with. And um, again, if one of the ways of conveying unconditional love is active listening, which I believe it is, then if you're not exposed to that as a child, if that's not part of your experience, it's going to be much harder to acquire that at a later age. Usually it will take some kind of crisis in whatever relationships you're trying to establish before you begin to develop the self skills um, to step back, look at what you've been doing, looking at where that has triggered um, kind of a push away rather than a pull in. Um, with, with someone else. So you and I are talking about, we're looking back in hindsight on accumulated life experiences. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of easy for us to look back and because of all the tumultuous events that both you and I have been throughout in our lives to land up where we are right now. Mm -hmm. So there's an old 12 step term, Joe, and I, as everyone out there knows I'm in long-term recovery. Uh, you, you, <laughs> you can't, you can't read the label from inside the bottle, right? Okay, so how do you help people understand to be able to, hey, I understand you're upset in this moment. However, let's step back and look at the situation. How often, how did you incorporate that in your life? I'm sure it wasn't always there. Right. And um, part of that, of course, is what I've been learning through 12-step recovery. Um, a lot of it has also been... Uh, through my yoga practice. I actually started doing yoga before I came into recovery. And one of the most important things it taught me was basically to be aware, um, both of my body and my thinking, um, in the moment, you know, if I wasn't paying attention to what was going on at that exact moment, I wasn't living it. So we all had to go through something to arrive here, okay? Mm -hmm. We're all products of our past. It's our past that propels us to the future. So could you share a little bit about uh, your life early on and how you uh, traveled through what you did, where you landed at some of your, maybe let's, more of your significant life experiences? Well, I already mentioned the, uh, the one aunt who died um, at a, when I was relatively young, um, but old enough to have appreciated what she had provided for me 
in terms of uh, emotional acceptance and uh, what I would call active listening. Um, from there, you know, I went on through um, the Catholic education until I was 12, uh, 12th grade, and then um, went to a relatively prestigious academic university where I was completely at sea and felt really isolated. Um, I was also at that time wrestling with my um, definition of my sexuality. Uh, I grew up in a particularly homophobic uh, cultural moment in the United States and um, felt very threatened by that. That's a significant uh, in factor in anybody's life that perhaps you don't need to go into many details, but there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of alienation. There's a right. lot of self-doubt. There's a lot of self-searching, introspection. And also, you're getting bombarded with perhaps false facts and information. Well, certainly a lot of negativity. Yes. <laughs> and uh, it was not something that was calculated to build up self-esteem at all and definitely reinforced my sense of being threatened by other people. You felt you were being threatened. Right. Um, if the world around you sees uh, heterosexuality as the norm and sees any departures from that as a significant defect and increasingly criminal um, and is then going to impose other uh, stigmas uh, on that, um, it's very, very difficult then to have any way of practicing your sexuality in a way that brings intimacy Trust. So growing up in a structured religious environment mm -hmm. and also having people already having preconceived notions mm -hmm. and opinions about a particular mm -hmm. sexuality uh, and that must have been a that must have been a really 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 difficult time for you. Uh, yes and it went on for decades. <laughs> please check out our website at fishingwithoutfaith.com where you can listen to the show, comment on our discussions, and find out where you can subscribe to our podcast. If you're interested in flying the colors of Fishing Without Bait, click the shop icon on our website. We have clothing, mugs, cell phone cases, and so much more. Show the world that you fish without bait. This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com.